Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is on home interview, Plattsburgh, New York, 23rd of July, 2007, approximately 12.45 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Clyde A. Lewis, born Hokum, H-O-Q-U-I-A-M, Washington, June 20, 1913. Well, what was your education prior to going into service? Public schools and Catholic schools in the state of Washington and Hokim. I graduated from South Bend High School in Washington. 1929, graduated from Notre Dame, 1934, graduated from Harvard Law School, 1939, came to Plattsburgh, In September 1939, I've been here ever since. Okay. Um, when did you go into the service? Pearl Harbor Day was on Sunday, December 7th. On Wednesday of that week, I was at 90 Church Street in New York City to enlist in the United States Navy. I had a brother who was a petty officer in the Navy, and I thought I should get into the Navy. I had filled out my application and everything, everything was in order. The lieutenant commander came out and called my name, Lewis. The Air Force, or the Navy, is not ready to accept married men with children at this time. We have your record. We'll see you later. I come back here to Plattsburgh. My law firm, my family were pleased. I still wanted to go into the service. At Plattsburgh, here in this base, it was Plattsburgh Barracks. For a long time, back in 1837, they started this Plattsburgh Air Force, but they started Plattsburgh Barracks Military. In World War II, it was the 26th Infantry here, and the Corps and the engineers at the end of uh, the war. The base was declared surplus and was conveyed to the state of New York for education on all purposes. Uh, Champlain College resulted, came here in 19, 1946. It was a GI college, two years. Very good. Had over 2,000 students when it started. In the 50s, the enrollment had dropped down to less than a thousand and Governor Dewey and the state wanted to discontinue the college. General LeMay, I met him, knew him well, wanted to put a base here for his B-47s. 
and one at a base here, and at Portsmouth, the B-47 bomber could get to prob the probable targets over the by flying over the North Pole, the short route. Mm -hmm. He came right, or is right here now in this area. He wanted to, wanted this base, number one, because of the location, number two, of the excellent flying conditions. We fly here when they don't fly any place else on the East Coast. They were going to have a headquarters for one of the Air Forces here. We work hard with General LeMay to get the base. The Air Force wants to come here and tell us about it. They call me in General Maddox, Brigadier General, try to get your group together. We want to talk with you. We got 27 people, bankers and everybody else. They meet and they tell us about the base. They would come here only if they could have Champlain College in the agreement with the federal government. There was a 10 year recapture clause any time within 10 years the federal government could, could recapture this property for defense purposes. After they explained everything to us, the general asked, we always ask this question, are there any of you here that would prefer not to have the base? Abs I was absolutely dumbfounded. Out of the 27 people, all of the hands except four of us raised, we don't want the air base if it means the laws of Champlain College. Hmm. I had three law partners, judges, doctors, the so-called professional people who were opposed to the base if it meant the laws of Champlain College. The senior member of our firm was a Benjamin F. Flanberg. He brought me to Plattsburgh in 1940. 1939, I came here into that firm. I'd married a Plattsburgh girl in Boston. And we got into an, a hell of a fight. The Citizens Committee to Save Champlain College, all of the big people. But the majority of the people were with us, and with the mayor, we formed the Citizens Committee to save. We, we formed the Plattsburgh Air Base Liaison Committee. And for a total of 43 years, I was the chairman of that. We had 107 members originally. Nobody served on that committee unless they were in favor of the Air Force. And when the base was activated in July 1956, it was a marriage. We got knocked out in 19... 92, and the final in 1995 when they closed the base, 
the BRAC Commission, BRAC, Base Realignment and Closure Commission. There were 60 recommendations made by the Department of Defense for closure of military installations. The BRAC Commission was formed to, to keep it out of politics and the BRAC Commission was to review the recommendations of the Secretary of Defense. Plattsburgh was not on the list for closure. In the final report, the BRAC's commission to review the 60 recommended base code, they'd had, it worked two years. Going around to make, make their, to review every one of the base for closure. Plattsburgh was not on the one, Air Force wanted Plattsburgh. The chairman of the BRAC Commission, a former congressman from New Jersey, a four-star retired general, H.T. Johnson, who was en route one time to be the first Air Force Academy chief of staff. He had been the head of the Berlin Airlift and also the, in the Panama. But the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Staff had reprogrammed the Air Force into two combat units, two units one for combat planes and service, and one for tankers, transportation. General Johnson was opposed to that and didn't agree, openly con contested it. They took care of him. He was sidetracked into a, another four-star assignment, and he took out his, you know, his vengeance on the, the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief, and he and the Chairman of BRAC substituted McGuire Air Force Base outside of Philadelphia in the, the busiest air lane between Philadelphia and New York City, substituted Plattsburgh for McGuire Air Force Base closure. The Air Force had absolutely no knowledge of what was happening from even their own staff that was a part of BRAC. I have the recording here of BRAC's, the final day of they made, as they made their report. They had adjourned for lunch, but they'd been some secret meetings they'd had nobody knew about. After the lunch, the chairman asked, is there a motion regarding Plattsburgh Air Force Base? H.D. Johnson, I move that Plattsburgh Air Force Base be substituted for, Mar for McGuire Air Force Base for closure. Is there a second? Bang! We were completely out. The 
chief of staff, so we tied our hands are absolutely tied to have to change the recommendations. The law provided they had to go back and go through all of the closures of all the proposed 60. Mm -hmm. And so we're out. And that's, and that was in 1995. Why were you originally so in favor of an Air Force base here? Well, I flew two tours. I was a B-17. Now let's go back to that. When did you enter service? In, well, in April of 1942. Good Friday, I was sworn in as an aviation cadet. When I was turned down by the Navy, I came back here and a Air Force and an Army recruiting sergeant in the post office building here in, in Plattsburgh. I went to see him told him I wanted to get into the Air Force, but I was too old to be an aviation cadet. I could only be 26 years, 11 months. When I went in for aviation cadet training, and I'd never been in an airplane until I started my aviation cadet training. I went through the, the program, ended up with four engines. Why did you want to fly so much? Well, Why did you pick that? Well, I just started, uh, I needed the, basically be selfish, I needed the flight pay. Oh, okay. An aviation cadet got seventy-five dollars a month. Mm -hmm. I had two children, no wife. Why did you decide to enter service at you were what about twenty-nine? What? Can we get How it? old were you when you entered service? When they entered the service, it was in in April. I was sworn in. How old were you? You were about 29, weren't you? Yes. Uh, I was 29. Why did you decide to go in at 29 the, the, with the, the, the master, the, the recruiting sergeant said, Clyde, look, I knew him well. This takes 26 months off your age. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and that, that didn't seem much, so we did it. And I didn't disclose my children. I couldn't have any children mm -hmm. if I was going into aviation cadet kind of training. And with the the problem with but I didn't realize it at the time. I was 15 years of age when I graduated from high school. Now, when I filled out everything, I was out of high school at, at age 13. <laughs> <laughs> and. They never, I never, my, my, my two boys in my correct age never appeared until I was overseas. <laughs> I changed it over the, my first tour. Uh, we went over in October 1943. I flew my one tour. After 15 missions. Now, who were you with? What what was your Air unit? Force, 8th Air Force flying in England. What uh, bomb group were, were you with? 401st Bomb Group. Okay. Uh, the top group. Our, uh, my 
High Squadron Commander was 41, class of 41, West Point. It was a West Point outfit. And our record was, well, we were number one. Where did you bombing, fly? In bombing. Mm -hmm. In two, two. In, in our missions, two missions. Recognize, recognize. We have the second lowest loss ratio. A B-24 unit was ahead of us. And we were, because of the the group and the training, we never let our people go in our, in our group. We never went to war unless we could fly tight formation. Mm -hmm. We almost locked wings. Jerry would hit us once and then they'd take somebody else. So and you flew in B-17s? What? You were in B-17s? B-17s. Mm -hmm. I flew by, after 15 missions, I was first to flight commander. And then squadron operations and a squadron commander at the end of my first and the second tour, and the second tour. In the early days, the loss ratio was, well, not too many made it their second tour. Mm -hmm. The loss ratio was better than 5%. It was meant that every 20 missions, there was 100% turnover. Mm -hmm. I, after my 15th mission, I, I became what they called an air commander. And I lost my crew and this operations officer. And I flew only as a, as a wing or a group lead in charge of 36 or three times that for a wing. After my first tour, I came home and went back for my second tour. And the second tour was 15 missions, if you could make it. I was in my 13th mission, my second tour, when the war was over. I came back to Plattsburgh. I go back to flew, flew, flew here. I flew more people. At six o'clock every morning, I headed out to the airport. Taught more people to fly. And on weekends flew. I became very interested in the VFW. I was with the one of the first state councilors, New York State Division of Veterans Affairs, when I came out. And they let me do they let me do my work in the law firm, assisting people to get squared around with their GI Bill and everything else. Could I go back to your service time a minute? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever get to name a plane? What? Did you ever name a plane? Name a plane. Did you name a put a my, name my, on a my, plane? My fleet with Pat. Pat. Your your wife, your look. Son, come here. Papa Clyde. Get me my jacket in the the leather jacket. Leather jacket. My first plane. My, my well, the plane that I the first plane overseas. Morning Star. Now, did you name it? Yes. Well, how well, how did you come up with that name? It, went, it was the only plane in our group from the beginning to the end. Morning Star. The Morning Star is always up there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Northern Star. That's why it was named Morning Star. Son. Yeah, the leather jacket's in there. Is it in here? You're sure? 
Right. The leather jacket's not there. In your closet in your room? Look out in the we garage? Yeah, in the we could wait till the end and find it. Wait, why don't we wait till the end of the morning, talk morning and we'll start. find it? And with the I flew that plane well most of the time for my fifteen missions and then after that I I well, I, I, I was an air commander in the mm -hmm. whatever the lead ship was. Was uh, your plane ever hit with flak? I don't like to repeat it. On the third daylight, the fourth daylight raid on Berlin, I was leading the last group of a thousand ships over Berlin. As we came into the, you could walk on the flak. Mm. They, we were at 25, 25,000 feet. And, but you did, and you just sat there and you, you said you're Hail Mary, that's all. You were going through it. We dropped our bombs, and before I, the bomb bay doors were closed, I was hit. And on this particular mission, when they posted Berlin on the board, I said to the crew, who was my old co-pilot, pilot, I said, If we're going to go to Berlin and be tail in Charlie, I want to be in the driver's seat. And I'm going to sit in the left hand pilot's seat. Fine. After the bombs away, two. 105, 10 to howitzers. They had absolute uh, altimeters on. Not contact. They were set for the, the altitude where they went off. Two of them went through our ship between the navigator and the pilot, co pilot, and between engine three and four. We were on fire. We got hit. Real hit. Your signal, if you were leading and you were boarding out, you always dropped your wheels. I couldn't drop my wheels. We put the fire out and as we were losing down, losing fell out of formation. I called the 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 wing leader. He saw me going down. Cried, "What's your condition?" I said, "Keep dinner for us. We're coming home." The navigator, my navigator. Arm almost lost off it. Clyde, you're heading to Sweden is such and such. You could glide into Sweden and out of the war. We were losing 50 to 55 planes every time we hit Berlin. The planes are going in there. Some of them were, well, they weren't hit too bad. <coughs> but you could get there with a little help. I said, Milt, his name was Milt Mahoney. I said, Milt, I'll bet you a $5 bill. We make it. Well, we had, we had a 
considerable fighting back and forth through some flak fields. The Spitfires, England picked us up at the, at the channel. We got back to England and landed. There were over 450 holes in my right wing. We landed, no hydraulics, the wheels, we stayed up, and then the ground looped at the end of the runway. Two of my crew members were radio man and the navigator were both critical, but they survived. After the briefing, I asked for the telephone to call my home base. Calling Colonel Williams, Colonel Sewell. This is Major Lewis. We don't have a Major Lewis anymore. He went down in a mission today. I said, he's here in England now. <laughs> Bill Sewell came on the phone. I told him where we were. I said, will you come and pick us up? He says, you sons of bitches, I'll come and get you myself. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. You sons of bitches, I'll come and get you myself. We had a rule in our group, if you had a rough mission, you had to fly the next mission, not think about it. Mm -hmm. We flew our next mission, and then we went to the flat house for a week. Where did, where, where did you go? The flat house. What did that mean? That the flat house. house is a rest. Rest and recuperation. We've never heard that term before. Rest and recuperation, run by the American Red Cross, and you'd go there for a week. They take care for a week. And and the well, it, it was rest and recuperation in England. Was that your most difficult mission, would you say? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Couldn't be any more difficult. Yeah. Did you fly any missions in support of the D-Day landings? On D-Day, I was on my way home. Oh, you were? Okay. On the Queen Elizabeth. It was between? From my first, mm -hmm. after we completed our, we completed our, 25 missions, and I was I came home for Russia and every and volunteering back. And the end of the war, I brought the remainder of the group home and then volunteered to go into the Pacific into the 20th Air Force, the B-29s. And the President Truman had put out an order that no field grade officers or above could go into the Pacific until they'd cleaned out the second Air Force where a lot of people, a lot of bit a lot of the Air Force people had been during the war and hadn't been to war. 
when I went back to report after my 30 days rest and recuperation at Sioux Falls, South Dakota, the New York Times had carried a story of the presidents. I went to the base commander. I said, I want to apply for separation. He had told me first that I had to go to Colorado Springs for assignment and I would probably be end up as a operations or a squadron commander in a B-29 outfit for training. I said, I've had too much combat. I want to get out. I went back to the to the base commander. I said, I want to apply for immediate separation. He said, we won't do it yet. You can't process it here. I said, well, then I'm going to go to Washington on it. There was a George Caffrey from Plattsburgh who was the executive officer of, the, of our congressman, Clarence Kilburn from Malone, New York. He was a senior on the Armed Services Committee. I called George, told him the story. Clyde, I think you're in a good position. The chief of staff owes the boss and our favor. That was on a on one day, and two days later, a Twix came into the wing commander, the base commander in Sioux Falls, authorized immediate separation. Clyde A. Lewis, zero eight hundred nine zero five. Report Fort Dix immediately. I was back home Mom here phone. in the first, the second week in July, 1945. I was oh. the last person that was cleared from there. And when I came home, I got it mixed up into the the flying and the VFW very much as a state veterans counselor. And two years later, I had become the St. Lawrence County's commander organizing the VFW and on the National Legislative Committee of the VFW. And in 1947, was drafted for the junior vice commander in chief in the convention, and that was automatic to move up to the commander in chief where I was in 1949, 1950. And then I, well, the 45 years I spent with the Air Force really here at this base. Now, when did you finally, when were you finally discharged from the Air Force? Well, I, 
I, I came home in July and, and with my on leave, it was in September, I was discharged. 45. Now, why did you work so hard to get this space here? Going back to that question. Well, why did you think it would be so good for Plattsburgh? Well, General LeMay asked me when he, he had to locate bases here that could fly over the, the, the not the, the Great Circle <laughs> route because of the B-49. Mm -hmm. And when I came home with the mayor and the for industry and we started to work to see if we could get something yes. in the military here mm -hmm. and we, we were boxed in with the Champlain College and then the well well, the, the two and a half years that we had to work to get the base here, get it cleared. I made 14 trips to Washington in 18 months. Back and forth. And uh, the Air Force wanted us, and a group of us wanted it on the Air Force. We had to overpower. I had to, Benjamin Feinberg, was Senator Feinberg, majority leader in the New York State Senate. They were opposed to the base. The county chairman, Judge Harrington, was opposed to the base. The bankers were opposed to the base. If it meant a loss of Champlain College, they wanted to keep the college. How was that situation remedied? What? How was that remedied? The college? How what, did you? They close the college down eventually. Did I what? Was the college closed? Did they close the college, or did it? Did the college well, yeah, stay open? Yeah. The, 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 the federal government finally recaptured the property. Recaptured the property. Champlain College was closed, and then they began the, well, the plans and the construction of this base. Uh, as I recall, the Air Force had an eleven million dollar saving if they recaptured this property with its with its buildings and the like. And then yeah, there's eleven million dollars because these house, houses out here and the well there's eleven million dollars they could save. And that's but but I just was the military and I was after I was a past commander receiving the VFW. I had access. I knew my way around Washington with the congressional committees and everything. Did the uh, others in Plattsburgh, did the others change their mind once the base was here? No, there, there's still people opposed to it. There were still people opposed to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Feinberg, uh, became the chairman of the Public Service Commission and uh, it, it, it hurt him to no end, but I was committed to it. I was committed to it. I thought it was right. Mm -hmm. I even off to, offered to uh, retire, resign from the firm, retire from the firm. I just put it in another telephone where I could use it. And, uh, the the opposition citizens committee to save Champlain College 
I was under the protection for the the FBI with threatening mail and letters. If you really want to bother somebody, call them, collect. We had camp, we had my wife and I at that time, about once or twice a week we had get telephone calls. Would you accept a collect call from Mr. Champlain? The Citizens Committee to save Champlain College and the students up and down. I get calls from Boston, Washington, further base, Philadelphia. Would you, would you accept a collect call from the FBI? Would, trace those calls as fast as they could. They would get license numbers, try to get license numbers, and where the calls were from. FBI man, Ed McShane, he's deceased now, he's an FBI. And uh, every, once a month at least, the BCI investigators would come to the office and with the threatening mail, skeletons. We lived through that. What was Curtis LeMay like as a person? Curtis LeMay was, well, he was tough. Absolutely tough. And he had to be. And uh, when I became, well, before the, after the base, I became very, very close to him on housing. He was a, for housing accommodations. After we got the base, we never had thought about the housing implications and everything. We didn't have any housing here of consequence for for 7,000 troops. We didn't have it. And there was a, the Air Force, this was in the Eisenhower administration, and there was the, a Cape Heart Sender Capehart from Indianapolis, from Indiana, had a Capehart Housing Act. And it's like the, well, they, they build the, like Federal Housing Administration, mm -hmm. and where the Reynolds paid and amortized the, the investment. And that's the, Eisenhower administration was opposed to it, opposed the Cape Heart Housing Act. And the, uh, the, the Cape Heart Housing Act became law because, you know, uh, the Air Force gave me their highest award, civilian award. I brought General LeMay in. General, when I, General LeMay, Caper, Senator, Senator Capers, executive, Force wanted Senator Capehart to testify. 
the sec no, they wanted the Secretary of the Air Force to testify on the Cape Argos. I testified for the group. I organized the, there were 12 bases in 10 states. I brought them all together and we had 24 United States Senators supporting the bill over them. Above the Department of Defense didn't want it because of the Eisenhower. They only wanted appropriated housing. Pay as you go, pay as you go, mm -hmm. and not the the the, the, the financing like Frown and I mean, like the Federal Housing Administration. But that was the way it was through. When they the Air Force the Center Cape Arch. The but the, well, that's the story. We got credit for that. Well, how many how many bombing wings were there here? Coming in what? How many units were there here at the base at its Seven. peak? 1,645 built. Oh, units. Okay, building units. Okay. Yeah, from the Cape Art units, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many air units were here, stationed here? How many air units were stationed here? Eight to eight and nine thousand pers well, personnel. Personnel? Yes. Mm -hmm. It must have had an economic impact then. Well, it was a positive a, impact. Yes, it was a big, big impact. Yes, big impact. You see, the this base. I'm an old pilot. Only once, as I there was, I couldn't get in here to Plattsburgh, and uh, when I was commander in chief of the VFW. I flew 120 hours a month around the country. We bought a plane for the Spirit of the VFW Navy on, put airline equipment in it, and I flew at, 100, at least 120 hours a month around the country. And I continued flying heavily. I even, well, I had an hour and a half flight in an FB-111. It was a Christmas present for me. An hour and a half I flew that when I was in, in the pilot seat. Didn't land, didn't take it off, but upstairs I flew it. I could still fly, but I couldn't physically. How did it, how did a jet feel compared to like a B seventeen? Well, well, my greatest thrill is the hour and a half I had in a one eleven every Christmas for years. They'd do something for me for Christmas. And this particular time, the Wing Commander Secretary called, and that Wing Commander was here yesterday, said he's right where you are. So and so wants you here at 8.30 tomorrow morning for a function. I go out, is Clyde, we own you for the day. Your schedule is cleared in your office. You're going for a flight in the 111. If you could pass a physical, 
I couldn't at that time. Flying it at 450 miles an hour. B-17 indicated 155, 160 in missions. They're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And they, but it was fast. It was absolutely fast. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? It was, it was all my, well, how has it affected my life? Well, if it hadn't been for the service, would have been no VFW. I shouldn't say this and don't mention this, but my biography is in Who's Who in America, Who's Who in the World. Very few. Air Force generals that were close to me are responsible for that. I know that. I couldn't have, if I hadn't been in the military, there wouldn't have been a base here. Mm -hmm. we, they couldn't have overcome what we were able to do. The door was open. I owe that to the VFW, the VFW owe to the military. Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, okay, no. Be before, we, before we close, we want to see if we can get a shot of you with your jacket. You have you, your jacket? Well, let me just stop the film for a minute. He's got all his flight uniforms, everything off there. Okay. okay. All right, we're rolling. You don't have to zip it off. You have to see the back of it too, though, you know. You what? You have to see the back of yes. it. Yes. Turn around, please. Can I help you? Now, was that the decoration that was on your nose? Oops. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Was that on the nose of your plane? What? Was that the nose on it? Yes. yes. Okay. That was the only plane that came back, Mark. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you. Want to sit down now? The morning star. Okay, thank you very much, sir.